Good morning and welcome to Facebook Live Worship on Trinity Sunday, 2020. My name is Mitchell Hay and I'm the pastor of the Essex Center United Methodist Church in Essex, Vermont. And this is the Reverend Barbara Ann Lemmel mm -hmm. of the United Community Church of Morrisville. And it is our pleasure to be with you this Sunday. We want to remind folks that on this Trinity Sunday, we will be sharing communion. Uh, I hate to use the word virtual communion because it makes it sound like it's not real, but we uh, will be sharing the elements here uh, in our dining room. And we invite you to uh, take elements in your own house today, uh, whether it's uh, a donut and coffee or a Triscuit and a snappy Cabernet or whatever uh, is in your house. Uh, bring those elements. Uh, later in the service, we will have uh, a time of music and we invite you to uh, get those elements uh, so you can partake in communion as well. Today is Trinity Sunday. And it's the only uh, holiday in the Christian liturgical year that is not about an event in Jesus' life or an event uh, in scripture, but about a theological concept uh, that is beyond human words and imagination. Uh, and so we struggle with it. Uh, we wrestle with it. And that's what it is an invitation to, that we have a God who, in God's very existential being is one, is unity, and also three. In traditional language, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or in more modern terms, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, or uh, other words, all of which fall far short of the reality of the God we know in unity and in Trinity. So we welcome you to this day as we gather to worship. And we have a uh, a prayer for opening to God time uh, that Barb and I will, uh, will share with you. This comes from Howard Thurman, uh, who was the Dean of Chapel at Boston University when Martin Luther King uh, was doing his advanced studies at Boston University. Uh, Howard Thurman was uh, an African-American theologian, an ethicist, and a Mm -hmm. A contemplative. And a contemplative, which uh, is something we are shy on today. He transformed so much of Martin King's thinking. Uh, so when Martin graduated and went on to be a pastor, uh, he brought much of what Howard Thurman brought to him. He opened him up to a uh, contemplative and action-oriented uh, way of life. And uh, this prayer comes from him. So I invite you to join us in a, a place of prayer. Lord, Lord, open unto us. Open unto us light for our darkness. Open unto us courage for our fear. Open unto us hope for our despair. Open unto us peace for our turmoil. Open unto us joy for our sorrow. Open unto us strength for our weakness. Open unto us wisdom for our confusion. Open unto us forgiveness for our sins. Open unto us love for our hates. Open unto us thyself for ourself. Lord, Lord, open unto us. Amen. Amen. That prayer gave comfort to Martin King in the midst of the struggles of the civil rights movement. Uh, I hope it can bring us comfort and also a spur to action in this time, this week, which has seen our nation uh, a mirror has been held up to our nation to show that we as a nation do not live up to the ideals 
of our constitution, to the ideals of who we were made to be. Uh, as people march in the streets, as we work on making our nation a better place and a better people, uh, I pray this prayer might be uh, transformative for us as it was for King. We uh, have had a week where especially for white Christians, uh, the voices of black people of faith uh, crying out for full humanity under the banner of Black Lives Matter uh, has been one we need to be open to and struggle with. We have a, a story from scripture that I guess I would subtitle Syrophoenician Lives Matter from Mark chapter seven. And this is a, a story of how perhaps Jesus' ministry was opened up by the wisdom of a woman he considered other. Emily is going to be uh, reading this piece for us. And uh, when Barb and I come back, uh, we're going to be in character uh, <clears throat> to help uh, maybe tease out some, some different interpretations of the text. So uh, Emily, share the word with us. From there, he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Sometimes... Sometimes following the master Jesus is like being a child again. He could give you new eyes to see the world with everything, a fresh perspective, a new insight, abundant and overflowing. But sometimes following the master was a chore, especially around the crowds in Galilee. Jesus' reputation as a healer and a teacher caused crowds from everywhere, all these little villages all over Galilee, people who traveled miles to see him, hundreds of them, and every face was, was hungry, was, was desperate for some, for some thing from the master, everyone grabbing a piece of him, a touch, a blessing, a prayer, an exorcism. Fix my eyes, Jesus. Touch my leg, Lord. Grant my wish, Master. It was exhausting. And so we were relieved the day Jesus decided to head several days' journey northwest to the city of Tyre on the Mediterranean coast, a foreign city where we could have a little anonymity, a little quiet where Jesus could avoid the crowds and spend some time with us, with those of us who, who took him seriously enough to follow him full time and not just wanting a, a piece of him, wanting just a, a quick touch from the traveling miracle man. So we arranged for a bed and breakfast where no one would know us, where we could have that quiet, and anonymity, and we just fell into the place. We were exhausted. I looked back at Jesus as I was closing the door, and he looked exhausted. Every bit of strength was drained from his body. He needed rest. He glanced at me, and I understood. Uh, he wanted me to lock the door and guard it from anybody coming in. Let him get his rest. 
And I went to close the door and bolt it. And just as I closed the door, a foot, a sandaled foot jammed its way and prevented me from closing the door. I looked up and it was a woman from Tyre, Syrophoenician from her dress and her pagan jewelry. We're closed, I growled. The master is tired. Go away, come back tomorrow. Cleaning lady, she growled back and barged right in past me. She spotted Jesus and made a beeline right toward him and fell on her knees in front of him. <laughs> ah, God. Jesus gave me this pleading look that said, dude, I gave you one job. I hung my head. In a world where women don't count for much, sometimes you have to make your own luck. Sometimes you have to take the reins into your own hands. I know that story and my life is the result of me trying to do that as much as I can. And in my life, I have only one desire and that is for my daughter to be well. My daughter is sick. Demons, episodes, something sees her time after time after time. And I have been to every shrine and every God and have sacrificed idols to every religion I can think of and some that I don't even understand. I have been to every doctor and my purse is lighter and my feet are tired and my daughter is still sick. So today, when someone said to me, hey, there's a Jewish healer in town, I thought, why not? I'll try Yahweh. I haven't done that one before. And so I went to the door and I knocked on it and this horrible little man stuck his head out and said, we're closed. The master's not seeing anyone. And at first I thought I would turn away. And then I thought, oh, I know what to do in this situation. And I said, I'm the cleaning lady. And he let me in. And I looked at the people in the room and no one had to tell me who the master was. He looked so tired. I hesitated for a moment, but my daughter is sick. And so I went and I threw myself at his feet and begged him to heal my daughter. Jesus is silent for a moment. And then he doesn't do what he normally does. He doesn't lay hands on her. He doesn't pray with her. He says words I've never heard him use except when he's arguing with some powerful religious mucky muck. He says strong, insulting words. He says, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, for us Galileans, that meaning is clear. Uh, Jesus saw his ministry as going to the children of Israel first, not to pagans, not to idolaters. But he didn't say pagans and idolaters. He said dogs, the feminine diminutive form of dogs. I think my jaw dropped. I mean, it was not an uncommon title that Jewish folk used of Gentile folk. Rabbi Eliezer would say, when one sits with idolaters, with Gentiles, one sits with dogs. It's a word we use. But nobody ever expected Rabbi Jesus to say those words. He was always so incredibly respectful of women. He, 
he offended the religious leaders in Galilee because he had women disciples and women were following with us. He, they supported him. They were there. He was, he spoke to them in public. We don't do that. He tells stories with these amazing female characters who, who are paragons of faith. So this really shocked me. Jesus really shocked me. And then this Syrophoenician woman really shocks me. She doesn't get flapped. She doesn't call him a name back. She doesn't run away. She does something I've never seen anybody do before. I'm not going to give you the children's food. We don't give it to the dogs. Wow. That felt like a punch to the stomach. Not just because he said dogs. I've been called dog before and worse. It's not easy to be a single mom entire. But I thought this was a rabbi. I thought this was a healer. I thought this was a holy man. I did not expect to get those words from him to be told that I and my daughter did not deserve what he had to offer. And something rose up in me and said in my head, fine, you can call me a dog. You can call my daughter a dog. You can say that we don't deserve your healing, but you are not going to see me cry. I am not going to let that happen. And I looked up at his face to prove to him that he was not going to see me cry. Thank you very much. And when I looked up at his face, I saw how tired he was. He looked as tired as my daughter does when she comes out of her episodes, when she said, God only knows whatever. And I thought, oh, honey, oh, honey, you don't mean that. Oh, honey, you are so tired, you don't even know who you are anymore. And instead of stomping out of the room, instead of bursting into tears, I found the strength to say to him, even the dogs get the crumbs underneath the children's table. And then it got really quiet. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. I had never heard someone come back at Jesus like that with a smooth verbal judo move like that. That, that. that was Jesus' signature move. Every time someone in power tried to trap him or trip him up, he would take their words, flip them over, and knock them down with the retort. Fine, you want to stone her? Let the one without sin cast the first stone. You talk about the moat in my eye, let's talk about the log in yours. We loved him when he did that stuff. And now someone had done it back to him. A woman, a foreign woman, a pagan foreign woman. And the disciples, we're, we're all looking around at each other. Our eyes are like saucers. We are scared. What is he going to do? No one has ever talked back so well to Jesus. What is Jesus going to do? He smiled. He took a deep breath. And his smile got broader and some of the weariness started to fall from his face. And he looked to me and he said, woman, go on your way for saying that the demon has left your daughter. 
And I stammered a quick thanks and I flew home. But before I even walked in the door, I knew that she would be well because he's the healer and because he let us in. Even if he forgets sometimes, that's who he is. So this is a tricky story, the story in scripture, because Jesus doesn't come off very well in this story. We like to think of Jesus as always getting it right every time. And it's hard to make that claim in this story. But one of the claims of our faith is that Jesus is, is was divine and human both. And I don't know about you, but I need that human part. I need the divine part too, mm -hmm. right? But I need the human part. I need to know that Jesus got exhausted. I need to know that some days when he looked at the next person coming his way, all he could think was, oh, not another one. I need to know that he knows what it's like to live in this world, to have more put on your plate than you know what to do with. That's why this story is in here, I believe. And the, the way it makes sense to us is that when she looked at him and saw his tiredness that mirrored his daughter's tiredness, her mom heart just mm -hmm. opened up and felt not only her own pain, but his exhaustion as well. So when Jesus couldn't even believe in himself anymore, and goodness, we all know what that feels like. When he was too tired to know who he was, she still believed in him. And because she believed in him, he could be put back together so that he could be the person that God made him to be, that she needed him to be, that he wanted himself to be. She healed him and he healed her daughter. Mm. <laughs> On Trinity Sunday, that's one of the things we, we lift up uh, for me with such thanks is that we have a savior who is not only the exalted second person of the Trinity, but is, but is one of us, that, that he poured himself out into a form that we could understand, a form that got tired and exhausted and overwhelmed and even even angry uh another one of those uh famous scenes of that human jesus is when he turns the tables over uh jesus apparently did not walk around with with the mind of god every moment jesus was was taught uh by his mom, how to speak Aramaic and, and read Hebrew, uh, taught by his father, how to, how to carve stone, uh, taught how to be a faithful Jewish man. I wonder if the Syrophoenician woman, when she said, you're better than that, he heard uh, echoes of his mom. You know, your, your mama taught you better than this, Jesus. Your daddy taught you better than this. This is a hard story for us to hear, but we're glad the story's in the Bible because it gives us a handle to help us connect to this human Jesus. For people of faith, this has also been a painful week. The newspaper every day is another litany of pain and blood another litany of voices raised and voices silenced. But just as we're glad that a painful story is in scripture because it gives us something to grab onto, I think we should be glad for the events of the week that are happening around our nation because it gives us it holds a mirror up before us. Maybe the Syrophoenician did that for Jesus. She held a mirror up before him to say, you're better than this. And we have a mirror being held up before our nation saying, honey, 
especially white folk, America, you're better than this. We know from the story that even Jesus can have a bad day. And we know from the voices of people of color that our nation's been having a bad couple of centuries when it comes to fulfilling the promise of treating all human beings as full citizens. I think in the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, when she said to him, even the children get the crumbs, or excuse me, even the dogs get the crumbs under the children's table. He heard underneath that her saying, honey, you're better than that. And so it's my hope, it's our hope that in the protests this week, in the calls for justice this week, we hear the pain, we hear the rage, and we also hear underneath it, the voices saying, honey, we're better than this. We're called to be better than this. Our nation was founded on principles better than this. And above and beyond that, we as human beings are better than this and can be and need to be better than this. I pray that we hear that call and that together we work to open up to new possibilities, to open up to things becoming more the way God would choose them to be, even though that's difficult, even though it'll be a whole lot of work, mm -hmm. even though it'll mean transforming ourselves in ways that we don't even understand yet. I want us to be open to hearing the voice saying, honey, you can be better than that. I want us to do that as a nation. I also long for us to be able to do that as individuals so that when someone speaks sharply to us, maybe at a rally, maybe in our own homes, maybe anywhere, instead of sniping back at them, we might pause a minute and think to ourselves, you're better than that. Not that we let people get away with treating us badly, but that we give them an out their opportunity to come into the wholeness of themselves, the godness of themselves. As we do that as individuals, as families, as congregations, as our society does that as a world, that's when we start to become the kingdom of God. And that is what Jesus was about. Amen. Amen. So this morning we have a song to share with you uh, that was written by Mark Miller. Mark is a um, ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. He often is at our annual conference. Uh, he's a friend and colleague of ours and one of the most fantastic musicians that either of us have ever had the privilege to know. I spoke about Mark's song last Wednesday at my spiritual um, practices for difficult times reflection. He wrote a lament um, that he said is founded in the roots of his ancestors in the African-American tradition. Um, and we're going to um, play the video of that for you this morning to share his pain, our pain, our country's pain. Following that, we'll join together in communion.
Powerful words and powerful music. Um, and it's a good way to transition into our communion time. Um, you know, we joke all the time about virtual communion, but at some level, communion is always virtual because it's an invitation for Jesus to come and be among us in ways that we completely do not understand any more than we understand the concept of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do when we don't understand is we just tell the story over and over and over again. And the layers of that story start to sink into us and fertilize us and redeem us. And so here again this morning, this story that you already know well, that when Jesus was gathered with the disciples, his last night on this earth before his crucifixion, they, he gathered them together for a meal. And as part of that meal, he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it. And as he broke it, he said to them, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And underneath those words, I wonder if they heard, I believe that you can be better than you think you can be and I go with you. I think that is what they remembered. They also remembered how Jesus took the cup at the end of the meal and blessed it and gave it to them saying, this is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <laughs> and so let's pray to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, in remembrance of these mighty acts of Jesus, in remembrance of his teaching and his ministry, in remembrance of all the ways that God created and sustains and continues to sustain the world. We ask that you might be present in our bread and cup in whatever place we are, that you might make them be for us the bread and body of Christ, that we might know that we can be more than we have ever imagined for the world for your world, for your kingdom. In his name, amen. 
I invite you now uh, to share communion by yourself, to offer communion with whoever it is that you're watching the service with. Um, and we'll join back together for pastoral prayer. Mitch, this is the body of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of life. My beloved, the body of Christ, broken for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. I wonder if when the Syrophoenician woman challenged Jesus, if she really wasn't saying, I believe in you, even when you're too tired to believe in yourself. We have the assurance that God believes in us, even when we are too tired or too angry, or too broken to believe in ourselves as beloved children of God, or to believe in others as beloved children of God. As we gather for prayers of the people, it's a time to recognize our brokenness and to offer that up. It's to recognize our belovedness and lift that up. We also invite you to share the brokenness and belovedness of other people in your lives. If you have prayer requests, uh, to please uh, type them into the comments on the side of the Facebook page so we can lift those up at the end of the prayer time. Uh, our prayers to the people uh, comes from the Reverend Jill Colley Robinson, who is our district superintendent here in the uh, recently renamed uh, back to our old name of the Green Mountain District. And so uh, I invite you to a time of prayer. Holy God, Holy One, Holy Three, you are all at once. From the beginning to the ending of all things, parent and creator, sibling and redeemer, spirit and sustainer. It is such a mystery how you are united, undivided, co-eternal, consubstantial, co-essential, and yet distinct, diverse, even different in our experience of you. Our majestic names and words for you in any language fall short. And yet, Yours is the mystery that brings us inarticulate to our knees at such a time as this. For if we are all truly and fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, then we too can be united and distinct, undivided and diverse, co-essential and different. This is your baptism. This is your blessing. This is you close as our breath with us always. We must remember. Let it be so. Amen.
And Jesus, we lift these prayer requests to you this morning. We pray for Warren and Kathy Miller as Warren continues to struggle with health issues. We lift up Val McManus, her husband, the anniversary of her husband's death is Tuesday, and this is a hard time for her. We lift up Judy Stancliffe's sister's husband, Dana, who is uh, receiving radiation for brain cancer. And we lift up Lorraine, who worries about him and struggles with getting their home ready for sale. We lift up Betty Harvey in these last days of her life. We lift to you Jean Sheehan, who has just received a diagnosis of multiple myeloma and for her son, Kevin. We lift to you all those who are graduating in this season, who had planned on graduation ceremonies and instead are making do the best they can with what they have. May you heal their griefs and also Help them launch forward with joy. And we hold to you all those who rally for justice and peace and equality and care in this country, praying that protests may be safe, praying that all of us, especially those in power, might truly hear, might truly understand might truly work to make the world a better place. From Essex, we lift up prayers from Donna, who prays for Diana, whose mother died Friday morning. We lift up the Parker and Amel families at the death of Catherine's father. With Tracy, we pray for Nate Smith and his family as he undergoes brain surgery this week. Liz shares a prayer that so many of us feel right now. I am so broken, Lord, as a mother, a friend, a family member, as an ally. Please remind me in these moments when I forget that I am indeed better than this and give me the wisdom and strength to stand up again to do better. We know Dana's going to be bringing her cat to Boston for, for her treatments. We pray for her and her beloved little critter. We pray for Vermonters who will be gathering in Montpelier from noon through the afternoon to bring their voices together, to share the deep truth that all lives cannot matter until black lives matter, that our nation is better than this, that our ideals can make brothers and sisters, siblings of all of us in a nation that knows justice and mercy and compassion and celebrate full humanity of all. All this we pray in the strong name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray saying, our father who Lord art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all for joining with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements before we um, close out. Um, the, 
uh, Morrisville folk will be joining for a virtual coffee hour at 11 o'clock um, on Zoom. And that Zoom link is on the Facebook page. So you ought to be able to click on that and come and join in. If you get stuck, give me a call or send me an email. Um, also, this coming week, again, there will be a live stream on Wednesday of spiritual practices for uncertain times. Um, there's a variety of meetings and other events going on, and those will be in um, the newsletter that will go out on Tuesday. We're looking to start a book um, discussion of the book, The Hate You Give. And if that's something that you're interested in being part of, please either give the church office a call or let me know directly. And um, we'll let you know as that gets rolling. We want to uh, give congratulations to all our graduates, yes. uh, especially uh, Art reminds us that uh, Matthew is getting his master's degree in education and we give him a, a big congratulations uh, to Matt Bristol. Uh, our local uh, food pantry is in need of face masks. And so uh, Paula Pickering is calling all sewers. It took me a second when I saw calling all sewers, but sewers. Uh, donations of face masks for our local food shelf. Uh, demand is up significantly and we need more face masks to keep all clients and volunteers safe. So please contact Paula uh, to be about contact, uh, dropping those off during the week. Uh, coffee hour uh, is, is a bit of an orphan right now. We were doing it midweek. We thought we would uh, try it after worship. Uh, and um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but is not, uh, we're gonna be moving uh, to a new time next week. And we'll let you know next Sunday when that is. We are going to be continuing our Monday night Bible project study. I really encourage you to come check this out. The discussion has been great. Uh, the uh, Bible project uh, animated Bible study is uh, in your newsletter, the link, and I uh, invite you to, uh, to be a part of it. Also was reminded that uh, this is the anniversary of D-Day when uh, uh, the turning point in the North Atlantic theater of war where anti-fascist forces uh, landed in France uh, to eventually bring an end to that dark, dark era of our nation's history, of our world's history, where folk were told they did not count and that their mm -hmm. lives did not matter. I pray that uh, we might hear that same spirit and same voice. So as you go from here, uh, we're gonna share a benediction with you and then we'll have some music from Catherine Parker, uh, a fantasy on when morning gills the sky. Um, so hear these benediction words. In the name of the divine and most mysterious Trinity, we have been called into being through love. We have been joined to one another in love. We have been placed in your world to love. So go in the name of the spirit who moves across the surface of the waters and in the beating of the human heart. Go in the name of Jesus, the God man who lived, died, rose and lives on for us. Go in the name of the creator, the recreator, the mother of grace, go in peace. Amen. Amen. And please enjoy this postlude from Catherine Parker, Morning Gills the Skies. Go in peace, y'all. Blessings. <laughs>